Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 91 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I have a couple of terrific guests coming up for you soon, but before we get to that, I wanted to let you know that my new book, a memoir, it's called Future Widow, Losing My Husband, Saving My Family, and Finding My Voice, is now available for pre-order on Amazon.com. And it's actually the Kindle version that's available for pre-order right now. I will have, coming later, um, paperback and hardback versions available for sale on Amazon.com and at independent bookstores. And I will have all those links when they're ready. Um, Those are not actually ready to be ordered at this point. So what I have done is go ahead and set up a way that you can order a book plate. Um, It's a free signed book plate. I will sign them and send them out to you in the in the first week in January when the book launches and I thought it would be kind of a fun thing since I'm not going to be having any uh, book tours or book launch parties in person to be signing books during the pandemic I thought this would be the next best thing so um, and the other nice thing about it is that if you order a book plate now I will let you know just as soon as the print versions are available for ordering So if you go to futurewidowbook.com, all the links are there for uh, pre-ordering now the Kindle version, which will be delivered January 5th, 2021, or ordering a free signed book plate. And again, then I'll let you know as soon as the print version is ready to be ordered. And there will also be links there as soon as the book is available to be ordered from independent bookstores and other places. So check it out, futurewidowbook.com. Okay, let's go on to today's guest. I had such a great discussion with Maria Collins of the New York Life Foundation and Chelsea Prox of the American Federation of Teachers for this episode. So New York Life and the AFT recently teamed up and they did a new survey about grief and about grief support in schools in order to especially understand what are the challenges right now during this pandemic, what teachers are seeing in their classrooms, the prevalence of grief um, as it is showing up, and uh, what teachers are wanting to know and needing to know in order to support our students. So we talk about all kinds of things. I think this is a particularly relevant topic since this is Children's Grief Awareness Month right now. Uh, It's November every year. And by the way, as I record this, uh, this Thursday, which is the 19th, is Children's Grief Awareness Day. So please, uh, if you think about it, wear blue in support of grieving children everywhere. Uh, But anyway, I think that talking to New York Life and the AFT for Children's Grief Awareness Month is particularly appropriate because... School is a an area where our students, our kids, and our teenagers, it's a major part of their lives on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. School is one of the major um, focus areas and areas where they're interacting with both adults and peers um, all the time. So I think better understanding, you know, grief in schools and how teachers can help our students and what the findings are of the survey and their suggestions for how parents can partner with teachers and with schools to help support our kids. So um, really a terrific discussion and uh, I hope you enjoy my discussion with Maria Collins and Chelsea Prox. My guests today are Maria Collins from the New York Life Foundation and Chelsea Prox from the American Federation of Teachers. Chelsea and Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you, Thank you for having, having us. Yeah, well, I've really been looking forward to talking to both of you guys today. And Maria, I should say, welcome back to you. This is the third time, I believe, now that you've been on the show. The first time with StoryCorps, and I had to look up the numbers, episode 28. So I'd encourage people to go and listen to that because I think that's such a terrific program they're doing. And you guys are, of course, partnering with them on that. Um, So thank you for sharing that with us a year or more, I suppose, ago. Uh, And then earlier this year, it was episode 72 with Heather Nestle, and you guys were talking about a bunch of things, but including the Brave of Heart Fund uh, that New York Life started because of the pandemic for families of healthcare workers. Um, So thank you guys for sharing that as well. Thank you for having us. 
Yeah, yeah, of course. And so, but today I'm looking forward to talking to both of you about a totally different topic, about the topic of grief in schools, and especially about the new survey that New York Life and the American Federation of Teachers have teamed up on in order to better understand the situation. So before we dive into the questions, um, and Chelsea, let's start with you since we've met Maria before, although we will re-meet you. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your role at the AFT? Sure. I am a former teacher trained in public health, and I work uh, at the intersection of health, education, and labor as the head of the Children's Health and Wellbeing Programs, or the AFT. So okay. it means I do a little bit of everything, and uh, hopefully that will make more sense as we move forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, terrific. Okay, thank you. And then, Maria, can you remind us of your role at New York Life? Sure. My role at New York Life, I'm the vice president of the f foundation. I oversee really our bereavement strategy, how we support grieving children and families, both from a philanthropic, but also a business perspective, looking at programs, initiatives, and resources to support grieving, you know, children and their families and their communities. So I'm happy yeah. to be here again today. Terrific. Yeah. Well, and I should say New York Life is, of course, an insurance company. Um, and it is, I, now correct me if I'm wrong, I think you guys are the major funder of childhood bereavement initiatives, programs, I'm not sure what you call it, but the work that's going on in this space. So it's terrific. Yes, we are the largest corporate funder for childhood bereavement um, that we know of, and um, we're happy to do it. We've been um, really investing in childhood bereavement strategy, our strategy for over a decade since 2008. And um, we've invested over $55 million. And wow. as I stated last time, it's not just the money, it's really the initiatives and the partnerships, like with the AFT, that are really impactful in, in identifying the issue and really coming to fill the gaps of resources and tools for this field and bringing mm. awareness to, to the children. Because, um, you know, I know we're going to get into it, but I, I do have to put, put it out there. You know, when you think of the statistic of one in 14 children will lose a parent or a sibling by the age of 18, you know that you need to really bring more attention and focus to this area, as well as resources. Mm. Because people do care about it, but you know what? Sometimes we don't have the tools and hopefully with great experts and partners and also podcasts, we can get information out to the public. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that one in 14 number. And I want to just uh, pause on that for a minute because, because even before the pandemic, that... Like childhood grief, I think, was a bigger or more prevalent problem than people maybe realize, certainly than I realized before I got involved in this. And so where does that one in 14 number come from? Some work you guys have done? Yes. Um, we worked with an organization called Judy's House and the JAG Institute. They actually um, looked at the prevalence of childhood bereavement. And they're the ones that have the stats. So if you go to judyshouse.org, if you look up the childhood estimation model, um, you will find statistics not only nationally, so one in 14 is national, and then for each state, there is a prevalence for each state. Like in New York, it's one in 20. Mm. In West Virginia, it's one in eight. So wow. one in eight children will lose a parent or sibling before the age of 18. And when you look at, if you go up to 25, that number doubles. Mm, to the age of 25, so, right. Mm -hmm. So the number of grieving children, teenagers, and young adults is, I think, a lot higher than probably most people realize. And I think it's important to say that is a pre-pandemic statement. That is. That is. It is. And um, I know that you have talked to Judy's house. Mm. And um, they are they have tons of information, not only on the prevalence, but also the impact. What is the impact of inaction? And that's what we're here to talk about. Because when we do nothing, then it's, it's the lack of support or the lack of understanding that causes the bigger gap. So we're here to talk about what proactively can we do and what tools and resources are out there to support grieving children and their families. Mm, yeah, terrific. Okay, so this obviously shows up in lots and lots of ways and areas and and so forth but i think chelsea this shows up in in the schools of course as a major area where our children and teenagers are um encountering every day so um can, like what are educators seeing as far as um even before COVID? i think do a lot of them have grieving students in their classrooms 
Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that almost one in 10 educators report that they are aware of at least one grieving student every single year. Mm -hmm. Um, And a significant proportion of educators, about one in four, say that they serve several grieving young people every year. Um, So, you know, they they know that these kiddos are there and, and need their support. And even for people who aren't necessarily sure that this young person or that young person is actively grieving in this moment, they still take this as a very serious topic. And there's mm-hmm. near universal agreement that this is something that, you know, schools can be better at, at supporting. Okay, so so this is obviously a, a, a big topic. Um, now, of course, we're in a pandemic. So I think it's terrific that you guys, American Federation of Teachers in New York Life, have teamed up on this survey. Can you tell us, Chelsea, why did you guys decide to do this survey? Sure. Um, I mean, the AFT and New York Life have partnered together before, and before COVID started, we really had wanted to revisit some of the work that we'd done together a few years ago to get, as Maria said, a a sense of the scope of the need and to really assess whether what we've been up to together and what we know some of our partner organizations have been up to was getting to the folks in the ways that we we need and and that they said that they needed. Um, So this was partly just, you know, we, we were inspired to sort of check on the scope of of what's happening in schools and the state of schools. And I think we were slated to release actually in about April of this year. And of course the world turned upside down in March. And so then so did our plans. And uh, we took some time to really rethink what we were asking and make sure that we were paying attention to the pandemic and how that might shift people's understanding of bereavement. And we wanted to both do sort of a a lay of the land and to ask some very COVID specific questions. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, much of what we want to do is move with a survey of, you know, that's national or attempting to be national in scope, we want, yes, to hear some stories and to unearth some names and some people who can give us powerful anecdotes. But we also want a sense of how widespread those stories are, even for people who don't necessarily get, you know, great platforms to tell them. Okay, so it's so great that you guys um, not only were doing this, but then pivoted to be able to, to cover the pandemic aspect of this. So can you tell us what are some of the key findings from the survey? Um, one of the things that really jumped out, I mean, we, we asked a, a solid battery of questions and we won't try to take people through every single one here, but one of the things that jumped out for me is that educators really report themselves at the forefront of every social challenge. Um, mm-hmm. And so as it relates to grief specifically, we saw one in four reporting that they were aware of a COVID related death in their school community. We wow, also saw- wait, wait, one in four of the people in your survey in their actual school community, a COVID related death. Wow. Yes. So that's that's a student, that's a parent, that's a coworker, that's you know someone on staff. Um, it yeah. wasn't necessarily in you know any given classroom, but in a sure. school community. That's huge. Okay. Right. So this is. I mean, Maria said it's it's widespread, and the pandemic just I think has highlighted people's attention to that. Mm. And I think the other thing that we really see here is that educators have sort of been turned on to secondary ambiguous loss or non-death related loss. They're much more aware that students have lost their routines, that they've lost things that they considered normal, that they've lost opportunities to celebrate milestones in ways that were really important to young people. Um, And furthermore, that families are really looking at significant changes in their finances and their employment arrangements and their housing. And any one of those things can reasonably lead to grief. But in some instances, we have educators who are really expecting of themselves that they help their kiddos with all of those things at the same time. Mm. Well, okay, so that brings up an interesting question. I think you had a a question for the teachers about how comfortable they feel addressing students' emotional needs that have been caused by or maybe intensified by the pandemic. Can you tell us what you found there? Sure. I mean, educators are, were really honest with us. They said, I don't know. You know, I think so much of of what we see is that AFT members are aware of the widespread nature of challenges they face. And when they're not sure, they say, listen, train me up, give me Mm -hmm. the resources. I am eager. I have high expectations of myself. And I don't, I'm not confident that what I'm doing right this moment is all that can be done. Mm. Um, so we saw folks say, you know, I've tried, I've tried some of the things you've outlined and I'm really eager for you to tell me more and to give mm-hmm. me even more so I can be sure that I'm doing what's best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really encouraging. I, I, it was interesting to me as a parent who's not an educator, right? Um, I mean, all I know about school is when I was in it a long time ago, right? I would have assumed that teachers just get trained in all these things as part of their 
learning to be a teacher. And I think what I've learned through, you know, looking at your survey and other people I've talked to is that they don't necessarily have training in, in grief specifically. No. I'm going to jump in here. Um, so previously, we this is where our work kind of sparked um, with all of the school communities. We did a survey in 2012 with the AFT to get a baseline of grief support and grief in schools. And we found that 7% reported that they've received bereavement training. That was in Wait, 2012. Seven? Seven. Seven, 7%. Wow. Although 93% of them said it was an important issue that they wanted training for. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they so just, it's they, not part of the what's normally done. No. And then when we repeated that question in 2020, and, you know, I was happy to see, but also it, it still is very low, 15% stated they have received some type of bereavement training. Mm. So that is an increase. It doubled, right? So that's a good indicator. That school districts are listening, they're trying to find resources for their staff, they are trying to implement, um, you know, support and tools that their staff can engage in to support grieving students. And a positive sign for us as well, over the, over the course of the pandemic, we've been reached, over the course of the pandemic, several school districts have reached out to us and said, we want grief training, grief support, grief resources. We are in partnership um, with New York City Public Schools at the present time. We're doing our grief sensitive schools initiative with them and supporting them with resources. Several other school districts have reached out to us as well. And they're starting on that path because they see one, due to COVID, COVID has shed the light on grief support in general is so important. And our survey kind of affirmed that where 99% of educators agree that grief can have an adverse impact on learning mm. for that student. So 99% really recognize that if someone experienced a death, a loss of a loved one, it can impact them social and emotional learning. Mm. And also another stat that I found really compelling that really leads to us why we do the work, why we're at the forefront of this is that 96% of educators agree that students who experience a significant loss generally need more support in school over the long term. And, and Jenny, you probably can, can agree to this. We found through other surveys, support for grievers drop off, right? Six weeks, three months, six months. Mm. And then it's not really discussed. It's not really saying, oh, you know, it's, and it's not that they don't want to, it's just the awareness, the education is not there. Mm. But educators seem to say, you know what? No, they need it long-term. There might be different triggers or different life events or different situations, which the child is dealing, the student is dealing with that we should recognize has to do with their loss. Yeah. So let's let's take a step back. You know, there is in one of our videos, because we interviewed children, um, students that experienced a loss and their experience in school and their grief. And one student said, we were learning about aneurysms in school. My father died from an aneurysm. She could not focus that day or that week that they were studying that because it hit home. It hit. So I think teachers, if they have the tools and resources and, and also understanding, they want to support it. And we're trying to help them with tools and resources. And that's why we partnered with the AFT. And that's why we also helped form the coalition to support grieving students. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, so many interesting things you just said, both on the philosophical level and the data level. Um, and I, in thinking about it as a, you know, putting on my hat now as a widowed parent, um, because my listeners are primarily widowed parents. And one of the things that I'm taking out of this is that I shouldn't necessarily assume that my kids' teachers have any kind of grief specific training that they want very much to help. They want very much to be supportive. 
and I shouldn't assume they already know. And so I need to maybe figure out how to help the, my kids' teachers help my kid. I mean, in addition to, and actually, I want to hear about the the um, grief sensitive schools initiative, and I think we're going to have a, a whole discussion on that later because I think it's a terrific program. <clears throat> but um, kind of bringing it down to the, you know, right now, how can um, parents work with teachers and work with the other people at the school to help their kids? So I'll jump in here. I mean, I, I think I want to first echo something Maria said, um, which is that in this culture, in, in a lot of Western cultures, there's a taboo against speaking about death. Mm. And, you know, what does death mean? How does death make us feel? How do we cope with death? Is daunting for adults to think about when we are supporting each other. And so for an educator to think about guiding young people through answering some of those questions becomes another sort of layer of challenge. Mm -hmm. And I know at least in my teaching experience, my, the schools that I worked for very often leaned into silence, leaned into saying as little as possible, because I think in retrospect, there was a fear of doing it wrong. Uh. And the fear of doing it wrong and the fear of, of abandoning that taboo was more significant than the, the motivation to make sure that all of our young people were served. Mm. And so I think one of the things that's a super clear benefit of training educators especially with frontline educators, is that we curate spaces to normalizing, to normalize open dialogue about death. Mm -hmm. And we make clear, you know, what can I say? Is it okay to talk about how, if I'm going to teach aneurysms, how do I do that in a way that still respects the young people who are coming into my class? Or if I didn't know until the day that my student showed up and, and suddenly was triggered and is, is having a super unpleasant time, how do I still for myself, behave as the thoughtful professional I expect of me with mm. this young person who I've obviously, you know, just made upset in some way or, or for whom I've, I've connected to some upset. That's a very tricky space. Mm -hmm. And I think when we just make, make room for educators to acknowledge that it might happen and help them do some role playing and some expectation that, you know, positive emotions are not realistic. Death is part of the human experience. And if we're going to talk about human experiences, it's going to get messy. And we can regulate those emotions. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to become clinical. It can really be just part of our day to day. If we acknowledge and get past this very cultural, you know, culturally implied message that we're not supposed to talk about it. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so does the American Federation of Teachers have some resources or training or information or something that if there are people who are listening who are teachers might want to access and or for parents who are listening maybe could um, you know send on to the teachers if they're looking for that information. Yes so I, I mean I think it's a it's a both and um, AFT members will be hearing more about bereavement training in the next few weeks. Uh, thanks to New York Life, we are going to continue to roll out and, you know, build on the lessons learned from the coalition, build on the lessons learned from the Grief Sensitive Schools Initiative. I think New York Life has done some really phenomenal work to think about what an entire institution becoming grief sensitive can look like. And AFT mm. is going to bite off a piece of a very complimentary apple and seek to build the skills and knowledge that make someone a grief sensitive educator, whether or not mm. your institution is doing those um, sort of parallel projects practices. And if you're not an AFT member, we make all of the coalition materials available through sharemylesson.com. Um, we put it there because we want to make sure there's no wrong door and we send people to share my lesson for so many other things. Not obvious from the name. It's not just lesson plans. It's for anyone who's interested in supporting young people and everything there is free. So I encourage Great. people to check out that website. Yeah. Okay, good. Terrific. Thank you for telling us about that. Um, Maria, I wanted to ask you, because I've heard that you've, I've heard you say before that in order to create a culture of grief sensitivity in schools, that we really need to have a collaboration between the teachers, the administrators, the parents, the broader community. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Can you, can you tell us a little more about that? Absolutely. Um, everyone knows the saying, and it's so true, especially today, it takes a village. Right? We all come to the conversation with a different lens. As a parent, myself, as someone that funds this, I think we can all play a part in supporting grieving students and our community. 
in essence. And I want to echo what Chelsea stated. I think it's so important how she said, it's silence. We're afraid to say something. We're afraid to have that conversation because we think we'll hurt or make it worse. But, you know, I have to say, I've learned through experts, through you, Jenny, through other people I've talked to, saying nothing is no longer an option. Mm. You know, it's changing the vocabulary. So I think how we approach it is really three prongs because it, it really is the philosophy of New York's life's bereavement support strategy. One, it's supporting direct service providers, right? So we, New York Life, have invested in bereavement support across the nation, you know? So we work with local organizations to ensure that if someone would like to access bereavement support, they have a local facility to do so. Two, right, research and evaluation, as I mentioned, Judy's house, right? The childhood bereavement estimation model is an indicator of how prevalent it is, but then what is the impact and what are the resources to help support grieving children and families? Because we know it's not that every child that's bereaved is going to experience um, adverse reactions. It's if they're not supported, if they're not heard, if they're not recognized and seen, those are the things that we know. And the third is the education awareness piece. Right. So working with the coalition to make sure that one, any educator and parent has access to the coalition resources. So there's modules, there's free training, on demand training. Basically, you plug and play. There are printouts, I'm dating myself, printouts or PDFs of information that really support not only the educator, but the parent, because we have parent resources. How do you support my grieving, my grieving child? How do I support myself? Self-care. So it is taking multi-levels of approach, different lenses, as I said, and all coming to the table and agreeing, what is grief? What does it look like? It looks differently in every person. Although it's universal, my grief is very different than yours. And just being, being able to put aside and being open to that conversation, creating that space, as Chelsea stated, which I think is so important. And we are providing that through, through education awareness, through tools, and through experts, because educators are not bereavement counselors. We don't want them to be clinical staff. We just want them to have the tools. If they identify a child that needs higher level of support, they know where to go. They know where to refer. And that itself is priceless. Mm. That makes a big difference because they may not know how to support that child in a clinical way, but they do know how to refer that child to someone that can provide additional support. Mm. They can be kind of the eyes and ears and, and noticing and maybe have some um, help in figuring out how they themselves can be the most helpful with the kids and then maybe when to plug them into additional um, support. And I think really challenging that, I mean, this is something we do in training and we hear a lot from AFT members who are counselors, psychologists, social workers. They love that we're offering universal strategies. All of us can do something to support a grieving student before their needs are clinical. And most children don't have clinical bereavement needs. And that's really important to understand. Um, the, these don't have to be, you know, this isn't rocket science. It's just, it's not something we talk about. And so it's, it's changing that more than it is doing anything complicated. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very important point. So, so let's then talk about, let's get really specific for a minute about, you know, parents having those conversations with those teachers and school counselors and administrators like, well, Maria, for example, I've heard you say that, that um, from year to year, a, uh, next year's teachers might not even necessarily know or be told that a child has had a loss. That is correct. Um, what we found um, is that we asked that question and unfortunately that information may not go from teacher to teacher or school to school. Mm. And when we think about because the other area we fund is middle school transition. When we think about education, our education career, our, our 
student's education career. Going from elementary to middle school is a transition that can be very difficult. Then going from middle to high school is another transition. And you're already trying to, or that student's already trying to understand the differences. I mean, the more independence, the, the acceptance, all of that is, is all, there's a lot of emotion, right? In, in those years. And if, if that teacher or that school is not aware that they've experienced something so significant, it makes it a little bit harder. And I think, you know, speaking as a parent and speaking to parents, it's, I think, unfortunately, the burden is on us to inform our educators as a partnership. I see parents as a partner in the relationships with their school, right? So you're going in there to say, you know what, before the school year starts, I would like to, I would like my child's teachers to know X. What is X? Mm. And I think that makes a big difference. I've met many parents that have lost their significant other and they're raising their children. And I always remember one conversation with this one mom. She said to me, he's having such a hard time. He's moving from fifth to sixth grade. And she said, you know what? I'm going to the, all of his teachers, mind you, there's seven or eight teachers in middle school. And she said, I met with every, I'm meeting with every single teacher to just let them know he is a good student, but he is struggling at this present time. And this may be why. Mm. And I think that approach was like, I'm not making excuses. I'm, I'm trying to be your partner. I'm trying to communicate. These are, these are the other factors going back to that social emotional learning aspect. Mm. These are the other factors that are, are influence or impacting his learning at this present time. Mm. And I want to work together. Mm-hmm. And I think that approach, although it's difficult, I know it's difficult for the educator, for the parent, for the student, for everyone, that approach makes it easier to have those conversations, I think, for educators as well as parents, because mm-hmm. you're putting the, the elephant in the room instead of outside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Justin, let me ask you about that from the teacher's point of view then, because I, I you know, I'm, I, wonder if some parents might think, gosh, it's September, it's the beginning of the year, my, you know, this teacher has 30 other kids, or in middle school, they have, I don't know, a couple hundred other kids, like, should I reach out to them? Is it too much to ask to, you know, take a little other time by email or meeting to fill them in? Or is that something the teachers would welcome? Definitely, uh, AFT member, AFT members are going to welcome more information about your kiddo. Uh, As Maria was talking, I was thinking about uh, a young person who was, I was a ninth grade teacher at the time. So he was old enough to do some of this for himself. Um, but he started out our entire year really making sure that I was prepared. One of the things that I did when we welcomed our young people from the middle school transition uh, into the ninth grade, I asked them at the orientation day, you know, some simple questions. What do your parents call you? Uh, what do your friends call you? Cause those are not necessarily the same in the ninth grade. <laughs> uh, you know, what's one place you want to travel to and what's something I should know about you to be a good teacher for you. And one young man wrote, my father is dying of cancer. And so the very first day that I met him, that was something he knew I needed to know. Mm. And as the year went forward, his mother was instrumental in making sure that I understood, as Maria said, he was actually an excellent student, but he never did any homework because he was playing personal care assistant for his father most of the time when he went home. He was helping his six younger siblings with all of their academic work. And he didn't have time to do any homework. Um, he didn't, you know, there was a point at which he really wanted to play a sport. And at our school, if you didn't do your homework, you generally didn't get onto teams. And ninth grade educators in my team rallied for him because it was the only outlet that he got. And we knew that he needed that. And if I hadn't had information about his home life, I might have just assumed he didn't do homework because I had never met that kiddo before. And Mm -hmm. they came from 42 feet or middle schools. So I could never have maybe not never, but I didn't usually follow up with everyone's middle school teacher. Sure. And the family really became essential to making sure that I knew what that loss was like for him in the immediate. And when, you know, the, the payoff as it were, is that I got invited to that family's funeral when his father passed and I had an opportunity to celebrate his life with them. And I, I was extremely honored to have that role in my student's life because that's not automatic. And it, is proof for me that I was the teacher I intended to be for him. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think that helps illustrate um, the importance and the 
opportunities around these kind of partnering that, you know, it's hard to have these conversations. It's hard to go to your kids' teachers and say, look, my kid's struggling. Here's what's happening and here's why. And it's hard to do that with seven different teachers and it's hard to do that every year. But what I'm getting from this discussion is that is really, first of all, important and secondly, welcomed. Yes. And I, I mean, I think I want to maybe just add some concrete things for widowed parents and, and your listeners to keep in mind. Mm. At the beginning of a year, if a loss is significant to your child, even if it's years old, educators can help mitigate grief triggers in advance if they know what that loss is. Mm. If your family has a new loss, even if it's not a death, but it's something that your child is taking very seriously, the school should have an opportunity to know that, again, because they can help mitigate. They can also start to observe potential patterns that you might want to keep track of. So if your child is suddenly drawn to doing something different or withdrawn from something that they used to do, if they are coping in a particular way, maybe they're acting out and they're they're angry and that's really their coping strategy for now, there might be someone on staff who can help coach them into a different coping strategy that's much mm -hmm. more impactful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the last thing I would encourage is even if it seems really obvious, and even if you feel like everyone in our community grieves in the same way, share your rituals. If your family wears all black for a certain amount of time, all white for a certain amount of time, if every Thursday night is going to be different for some amount of time, if your temple has a big role for a particular set of weeks, that is something that educators can have in mind for group projects and for grading and for tests, for example, that allows them to be thoughtful in getting together accommodations. So they're not imagining or stereotyping or prying into your life, but they can be thoughtful about what you need and what mm. your young person needs. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, and so speaking of and one more practical question, I guess, what other staff at a school? I mean, I think everybody the first thought is, okay, my kids in these classes, so they have these teachers. But are there other people at a typical public school that we should be aware of that maybe we should loop in as well? Sure. I mean, I think it's important not necessarily to feel that you have to know every adult in a school setting and you might recruit an adult to help you do some of this work and, and sort of spread the word, right? I, I'd like for you to let everyone who works with my kid know these three things. And it could be mm. Chelsea's really good at art and her father has died and she loves soccer, right? It doesn't mm. all have to just be about bereavement. Mm -hmm. um, but if those are the things that every adult needs to know, I think you know, educators, and by that I really mean anyone who works in a school, know that strong relationships are the foundation of healthy young lives. And mm -hmm. they are ready to take on leadership in those caring relationships if they can. The mm -hmm. more information they have, the better. So if you've got a front office attendant who sees your kiddo every day and is trusted, they're perfectly poised to be an adult who can help you. Mm -hmm. um, the bus driver, the recess monitor, the custodian, the paraprofessional, I think those are all folks to have in mind as potential helpers. And I will also say, um, I think I sort of noted this before, but the counselors, psychologists, social workers are often the first person that someone in a school will call and they'll sort of say, okay, well, Maria's been trained in this and so she'll know what to do and I don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And those folks, you know, I, I think they should really only get looped in if your student or your young person is really leaning into clinical challenges, um, if they've got months of complicated symptoms, but for the most part, you know, the, the everyday people is, is who you need to see, who you can count on on your team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think that's helpful. Um, okay. Well, gosh, I, I think we could keep talking forever here, but we probably need to, to uh, wind this up soon here. So let me see what I, did I forget to ask? Oh, well, um, let me just ask you both then what resources New York Life has and what resources AFT has that, that parents should know about. They might want to check out on your websites or elsewhere. Maria, we'll start with you. Great. Um, so, you know, funding and being a partner and an active partner in this for over a decade, we have tons of, you know, resources for parents, educators, and just the general public. Um, I would like to highlight, of course, the Coalition to Support Grieving Students. So that web address is grievingstudents.org. Again, it's free, accessible, it's video-based, and there's written material there. And we have added additional content due to the pandemic. So take a look at that site. Also, if you go to newyorklifefoundation.org, we have blogs, resources, um, links to all of our partners from First Book, who provides free and low cost books to educators to support um, their community, especially we relaunched their grief and loss section. And um, 
this month, November, in December, there are credits for educators. So take a look at New York's Life um, posts and first book posts for those credits. Um, you can get a group, um, you can get some credits to order some free bereavement and lost books and resources there. I also would like to highlight um, a new series and we've talked about it. It's called Kai's Journey. New York Life is very proud to launch a three-part series um, for young children that talks about the loss of a father. A little boy named Kai loses his dad and these three books talk about you know, his loss, peer support, family tradition, and really how do you, you know, live with the loss of a loved one. And we created a discussion guide to go along with it. And we think it's a great way and a great tool for parents to openly discuss and remember the person they've lost. Mm. Because I think sometimes we don't have the words. And also we have to remember when a child loses a parent, we also lose as a parent, we lose our partner and we're dealing with our own grief. So talking about it, I've been using the word bittersweet and um, because I think like we want to remember that person, but we're also very sad. So how do we talk to our children? And sometimes having almost not necessarily a script, but some key points mm -hmm. that we can talk, talk to our children and questions that can facilitate conversation that will naturally come, but sometimes we need kind of like that jump start or some, some key words to use. And then it becomes so natural to have that conversation. So I do want to highlight Kai's journey, which we just launched uh, two new books, The Girl with a Locket and The Fish's Lake this month. Mm -hmm. And um, the books are absolutely free. And for every download, we will donate a dollar um, to a children's bereavement charity up to 175K. And this is our second round. We did it first with the golden sweater. So this will be an additional 175. Mm -hmm. So that's like better than free. Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's free to the reader. Plus you're giving a donation to the different charities who are so instrumental in, in doing this work. And so I'm glad to hear the update. Thank you. Because the last time we talked, you had launched the first book. And so now it's great to hear that you have two more. So I'll put the link for sure in the show notes um, to those. Yeah. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, no. And, and, and I want to thank, I want to thank you for being so gracious and having us back and to all of our partners, because we couldn't have really put together this book, these books without our partners and the stories from real families who, who share with us the most intimate details and what has been helpful to them. And that's where the book series comes from, a place of love and, and, and trying to understand and connect and provide something back to the community for them sharing with us. So the story, although it's a fictional character, um, it is based on, you know, several stories that we know and programs that we've seen firsthand that have supported children and families that are dealing with the death of someone that they significantly love. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and, and Chelsea, I know you touched on some of this before, but if you could just remind us of the resources that AFT has, either the parents might be interested in themselves or maybe to refer their teachers, their children's teachers to. Sure. Um, I mean, I think a lot of what we learned from the survey is that bereavement specialists, uh, very often funded by New York Life, are doing phenomenal work. And the AFT's role is just to connect more people to what already exists. Mm. So much of what Maria just said is exactly what the AFT will point you to and what we've sort of duplicated on various websites and what have you. I think the fastest and easiest place for educators and for families to go is sharemylesson.com. Um, but if you're super interested in the union's work, you can go to AFT.org. And if you want very up-to-date, uh, you know, information and, and blasts on new things that we are, we're doing, I hope to to announce something that I think we have in the works with New York Life soon, uh, that will go up on Twitter. We do we do all of our up to date stuff on Twitter. So at AFT Union. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And uh, Maria, tell us again New York Life Foundation's website or the website for the resources you mentioned. Sure, you can go to NewYorkLifeFoundation.org. Okay, 
perfect. Uh, and is that the best place to download the books too, or is there a separate? It it is. Um, the books have a special URL, um, kaisjourney.org. But if you go to NewYorkLifeFoundation.org, it will lead you straight to Kai's journey. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Well, I think this is a great place to end. So my guests today are Maria Collins from the New York Life Foundation and Chelsea Prox from the American Federation of Teachers. So Maria and Chelsea, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank Thank you. you for having us, Jenny. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Maria Collins and Chelsea Prox as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com and look for episode 91. And a shout out today to everyone who has tuned in to the Widowed Parent Podcast live episodes I've been doing recently for Children's Grief Awareness Month. So uh, like I said before, November every year is Children's Grief Awareness Month. And this year, I'm doing something a little different, something that I thought would be fun and useful. I am interviewing different, well, mostly grief programs and grief centers who run kids and family grief groups and programs in all different communities, Uh, interviewing them uh, in live stream interviews once or even twice a day. This week, I think it's twice a day. Um, It's been so terrific. I've talked to people in New Jersey, Georgia, California, Montana, Oregon, North Carolina, Missouri, a um, whole bunch of other ones. I'm sure I'm forgetting them off the top of my mind. But if you go to my website, JennyLisk.com, and if you look at the menus, one of the menus has resources. And there's an item in there that's uh, grief programs and resources. And you can find actually on that page a listing by location of all the different programs that I've interviewed so far. Um, I think there might be a couple of dozen there by now. And I'll be adding more in the coming days and, and for the rest of November here. And actually, I've decided that this has been such a terrific way to get the word out about these resources to my listeners and to widowed parents, to people who are looking for some kind of grief support for their kids and their families, uh, that I'm actually going to continue this beyond Children's Grief Awareness Day. I'm not going to keep doing two per day, but I think I'll probably do two to three per week. Um, and keep adding resources to the list because even though there are a couple dozen on the list now, there are so many more resources that I want to let you guys know about. And I want to make sure that I have as many as I can in different communities so that people can find something useful to them. So um, if you've been tuning in to the Widowed Parent Podcast live, it's, it's on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and my website live and then after the live show is finished um, I post the recording to LinkedIn and to Instagram as well and also to my YouTube channel of course so lots of places to see it and I will um, put a link in the show notes to find those so um, oh and one more thing please do go to futurewidowbook.com and go ahead and Oh, if you're interested in reading the book, order a free book plate and I will mail it to you if you're interested in the print version or the uh, Kindle version can be pre-ordered now. So again, that's futurewidowbook.com. We'll take you to all of those links. Okay, all for now. Uh, As always, thank you very much for listening and until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.